Okay, my name is Lige. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Ivy Tech Community College, which is Indiana's community college. We're also the fourth largest higher ed organization in the United States. Has anyone heard of Ivy Tech? A few, few people have not, I assume, because that's usually the, uh, the case. So I've got a little bit of information about sort of who we are. That kind of sets the stage for you know, this presentation and, and put some of this in the context. So I won't read all this to you because even my kids don't like that anymore. Uh, but needless to say, we've got about eight or so thousand employees. We teach about 60,000 online and on-prem course sections a year. Um, as an organization or as an enterprise, we have about 1,200 different software applications that we support. And you can feel sorry for me if you want, because that's a lot. Um, we have about 100,000 network devices every single day. Uh, almost half of those are BYOD, of course, student devices and faculty and staff. Everybody has to have three nowadays. Uh, our user base, from an IT perspective, is about 900 and some thousand people. It fluctuates, as you can imagine, daily. So we're approaching a million. Haven't quite crossed that yet. And then from a data perspective, as an enterprise, we generate about 100 million rows a day um, across the enterprise. So um, if you're a data person, that's a lot. If you're not a data person, it's still a lot. So uh, to give another, a little bit more perspective to that, just about three weeks ago, we crossed a trillion rows in our biggest database. So uh, we, we did have that in Oracle, and then we couldn't query it anymore. And so we, we do it a little bit differently now, and I'll talk about that here in just a minute. So where we started with all of our predictive stuff was, was really this. The president of the college, and this has been about four years ago now, had challenged the entire organization with, by saying, you know, our students aren't completing, they're not persisting as much as we would like. And that's a very fuzzy statement, and I left it fuzzy on purpose. And in the IT group, we like to play around, so we called that a ghost monster. So that was the monster in the room, is how do we, as an organization, help our students do better? So <clears throat> from our perspective with technology, one of the things that we talked about in my department was what could we do? You know, we don't teach students. We're generally locked in a basement somewhere. You guys can probably relate to some of that. So what is it that we can do? So the tools that we have at our disposal are, are really three big ones. Uh, the first one is something we call NEWT. NEWT uh, stands for the new thing, and then we got lazy and chopped the the last of it off. But what that is, that's our cloud-based data warehouse. That's based on Redshift. We do a lot of stuff at Amazon, of course. And that trillion row table, that's where it is now. And we can actually query it. So we're happy about that. We also use a lot of cloud services outside of Redshift. And so anything that has to do with lots of data, we do that in the cloud. Because as a community college, we just don't have a big budget. We're not like some other folks in the state of Indiana. I like to pick on Notre Dame. So if they're here, I apologize. But they've got much larger resources than we do. <clears throat> now, we are probably 20 times their size, but they have a lot more resources. So for us to do anything cost effectively, we, we have to do it in the cloud. We just don't have another choice. And we also use a lot of open source software. Back to that whole cost thing. So, so where we started was really with that one question. And then in our brainstorming sessions that we had with a, a few of my folks, um, one of the things that we brought up is, well, what if we could tell a student was in trouble? Now, I know that there's some, lots of early alerts and flag systems and, and lots of things that, that higher ed folks have developed, and that's all fine and dandy. But we, we just sort of took a different approach to it, and we said, well, what if we could do it automatically? So how early could we tell? What would we do about it? How accurate would it be, of course? That's always a question. And then, and then fundamentally, where would we even start? And so being IT people and not being academics, we just sat down in a room and came up with a different, uh, an approach to it, and I'll kind of walk you through that. So what we did was we sat down with those academic folks and we just asked them what makes a good student. The, the idea being that a good student needs less help than a not so good student. And I'm not trying to be derogatory when I say not so good, but you know. <clears throat> so we sent out a survey, we talked to a lot of folks and these are actual answers that I got from the academic folks around our organization. Um, some of them made a lot of good sense to us, some of them didn't. And then really, as you can tell, like with pays bills, it depends on who we asked, right? So from a finance person perspective, a good student is the one that pays for their class. From an academic perspective, it's someone that, you know, is engaged in the classroom. So these are a few. Uh, my favorite, of course, is right here, ask questions and then doesn't ask questions. We actually had those answers. Um, but that's okay. And as you'll see here in a minute, it doesn't really matter that they're the opposite of each other. But it was just, we thought it was kind of funny. So these are some of the things that were, that were uh, brought up, and there's a bunch. And I don't remember how many we ended up with, but it was a lot. So what we'll do is we'll just take one of these, and this is the process that we went through. <clears throat> we'll take engaged in class. And we bring that up, and we say, what does that really mean? So we got that answer. 
and we dove into engaged in class on my team and said, what does that mean, right? So what does that statement mean? Pays attention, they participate, maybe they read their assignments, uh, they do their lab work if there is such a thing, they do their homework, right? That's one that lots of people are interested in. They raise their hand maybe in class, uh, maybe they enjoy their course material. We made a long list of each of those things that we thought might be a part of engagement in classroom. We also ran this by a lot of our academic folks and got their buy-in, yeah, that's kind of close. But again, as you'll see in a minute, it doesn't matter that it's not exactly accurate. And we don't even have to agree necessarily as long as we capture the important parts. So then we went back and we said, okay, let's take participates in class <clears throat> from that previous list. How would we represent that in the data that we have? Now, go back to the, the weapons that we have. We have Newt. In our Newt system, we have a vast amount of data and hundreds of terabytes of data that we've collected for years across probably 100 systems, 100 different software applications. So we have a lot of data. So uh, participates in class might mean they log into our LMS system or they've emailed somebody on, on campus for some reason, um, that they go to stuff, that they talk to people, um, that they don't get flagged by an advisor in our advisor system or, or, or a faculty member in our advisor system. It might mean lots of things, right? They use a chat feature if their class has it. Or maybe they're even tweeting about their class and how awesome it is or, or not awesome it is. <clears throat> So that's how we might um, identify some of that stuff in data. The other thing that we did, and this was something that, uh, that the IT folks threw in there, we also took the inverse of that, and this is kind of important. It's not just the data that you have, it's also maybe the data that you don't have. So if you, you know, like in our LMS, you can say, has this person logged in and you can get a count. If they haven't, they're not in there at all. But that means something, right? It, it implies a zero. But in other systems, it's not as obvious as that. So we took the inverse of everything that was in there. So I won't walk you through those because it's the opposite. And then we got very specific, right? So we took all of those things that we, that we laid out and we said, how can we actually get that from data? So with the LMS, we can obviously query logins if we want to use that. For email, we actually have metadata on every email that's sent. So the time it was sent, who sent it, where they sent it from, it's metadata, right? It's not the email text, we don't care about that, but it's who it was to, who it was from, and just the metadata about that. <clears throat> Also, we have data from uh, our student activity system in the library. If someone checks out a book or they print something or they log into a PC in a lab, we have a, a portal, right? And so students can log into the portal and do whatever students do on the portal. We do have that advising system that I mentioned. We have logs from our chat system. If they've done online, uh, online tutoring, we have that information. So we actually do have some very specific data points that might be representative of engagement in the classroom. Does that make sense? So what we do, what we do with all that is we throw all that stuff into a blender. I will explain the blender here in a second. It's machine learning. So we have some machine learning tools. These are all open source based that we've worked on. We throw them into that blender. <clears throat> Very neat animation there. And what that generates is a model. So take all that data, throw it in the machine learning tools, and it generates a model. You can use AWS as machine learning tools, you can use Mathematica, you can use R in some cases. Uh, we can't because of the volume of data. Uh, we use Python is what we use. Lots of machine learning tools out there, but what, those, what that'll do is take that data, call it a training data set, and generate a model of the student's behavior. Now what we do with that, and we can call it the good student prediction model, is every single day we take all that same data and we feed it back in. So we would use, let's, I'll make it simple, we would use this spring's data, generate a model, and then in the fall, every day, we'll feed in the new data set from the new students that we've never seen through that same model. And what we end up with is a pretty good student prediction. And I'll get to tell you a little bit about that. So, <clears throat> one of the things that we do is we, we do, this is, a, this is my last slide, so if there's any questions. One of the things that we do is we take all that data that we've, we have for years and years, we build these prediction models, and then we feed in that daily information as the student goes through their classroom, right? Or goes through their academic life at Ivy Tech. And what we're able to do is identify which students are likely to succeed and which students are likely to fail. Yeah, where'd it go? There we go. So this past spring, we actually hit 83% accuracy on week two of a 16-week term on predicting what a student was gonna do in the class. Now for clarity, the way that we define good and bad, bad is a D or an F, or a withdrawal, and then good is A, B, or C. Um, the, we re the reason we chose that had to do with financial aid, and our financial aid folks would have to explain that to you because I don't fully understand it, but we just rolled with that. So um, 
week three, let's say, or the 11th day of class, we can run their behaviors through the prediction model and more than four out of five times we were accurate on what they were gonna do 14 weeks later, or well, no, 16 weeks later, 14, whatever it is, 14. So <clears throat> what we have is a system that builds models. So what I showed you was that blender, right? So we designed that blender that brings those inputs in and then generates a model. What we don't have is a model, and I know a lot of, there's been a lot of work done um, over the years with uh, different institutions that have built mo models of behavior based on their students and whatever, whatever variables they wanted to include. We don't do that. What we've identified is markers, if you will, that are key components of a model, and then we let the computer generate the model. Another thing that we don't do is we don't do anything based on cohorts. And that's, I'm not a higher ed guy. I know I work at one, but I've only been here a few years. And that's not a term that I even understood until I got in higher ed. But the problem that I see with that and that we've seen with that is it's great to, to know that, you know, bald white guys in their 40s do certain behaviors. But once you start to get into different demographics, maybe that doesn't hold true. So we don't do anything with cohorts. What we do is we let the data define the cohorts for us. And we base, at least with the, um, the stu student success stuff, we call PEZ, project, uh, project Early Success and Predicting Student Success. What we do with that is we base it on behaviors. Um, what's the number one thing someone can think of that, that, would, that would help predict a student's success in a course? Name something. Somebody. Grades, I heard grades. Attendance. So grades and attendance are the two that I always get. That's why I asked that question, because I know what you're gonna say. And we don't look at either of those. We don't look at any grades with this, we don't look at any, to any attendance, and we hit 83% accuracy with it. That's because, there's a number of reasons. Uh, grades would be a good one, but two weeks into a course, a lot of people don't have grades yet, right? So we look at how they're interacting as students and how they're acting as people, not as to how they're performing necessarily, and it turns out there's some pretty good correlations there. And so we don't look at grades for a variety of reasons. One, they don't always have them. Two, sometimes the faculty don't enter them. Uh, grades also in our organization have a tendency to change a lot. And I've seen lots of students with D's and F's and get a B in the class, and lots of students with uh, A's and B's get an F in a class. So we just don't look at them. Then the other reason we don't look at it, or the other reason that we don't look at attendance is that's very difficult for us to get. We're not an attendance-taking organization, so which wasn't an option. So we just throw them out. So we really look at how students behave. <clears throat> and with that, you see a little, you guys, did you just catch that? Let me play it again for you. So now the ghost monster is blue, right? So now there's something we can do about it. So before I get to that, what we did with this data this, this past fall and this past spring was we organized a statewide campaign to call every student that we identified that was going to fail. And we did. Uh, in the fall, and I don't have a slide on it, there were over 16,000 students that we'd identified were going to fail. We knew that over 80% of them were going to fail. And so we called every single one of them, and sometimes multiple times. Now, this was a somewhat of a voluntold effort across the college, right? So some people volunteered, some people were told. And we called them all. We collected data on every phone call. We had the callers fill out even more detailed data on the reactions of the students and what we learned and, and this, that, and the other. And I should have put a slide in here for this. <clears throat> what we saw after those phone calls, we looked at the midterm grades because that's really our first point, our data point that we can say, did this matter? This past fall at our midterm grades, we saw the largest percentage drop in bad grades, those D's and F's, that the college had recorded in 50 years. Now, there's other things going on at the college. Certainly, that one phone call wasn't everything, but it certainly made a big dent, a bigger dent than we had ever seen. I'll give you a couple other little fun uh, tidbits with that. When, as I mentioned, we collected information on those phone calls, right? So the callers, they would talk to the student, and they didn't say, by the way, Eric, uh, you're going to fail this math class in 14 weeks, because that wouldn't help. We gave them scripts, and the scripts were very, uh, were very uh, tailored specifically to say, Eric, you know, how's that math class going? Because what we gave those callers was the name of the student, the course they were going to fail, and why they were going to fail it. So they had some, they had some ammunition. <clears throat> what we did, when we, what we learned, because that caller would fill out a, a form and gather data on the phone call, what we learned from those call forms was astonishing to me. So a lot of the things that our students were experiencing really had nothing to do with Ivy Tech. We're a community college, right? So we're a commuter school. We don't have dorms and some of the things that some of the other bigger schools have, or I guess bigger, <laughs> different schools have, four-year schools. We had learned that uh, we had 12 students in the fall that couldn't pay their electric bill. We had 16,000 students that we called. 12 of them expressed to us they couldn't pay their electric bill. The way that was manifesting itself in our data told us something wasn't right. Well, I can assure you, and you guys I'm sure can relate to this, if you can't pay your electric bill, going to school might not be the number one thing on your mind. 
right? Well, maybe it is, probably not. But when we knew that, then we could, we actually, we anticipated things like this. So we equipped our callers with scripts and information about community uh, services. Ivy Tech has some emergency services that we can do based on our alumni foundation. So there were things that we could do to help them with that, but that was not something that a student was ever gonna come to us with or something that we even knew existed. Now we did learn some things that were very relevant to Ivy Tech. So we had learned that our bookstore wasn't necessarily stocking the books in all the locations the way they were supposed to. We have a contract in place, but you guys know how that goes, right? So we actually got a hold of them and made some corrections so that the course materials were actually there on time. In the first two weeks of a class, if you don't have a book and you have a test on the third week, a lot harder to pass it, right? So we identified some things like that. And it was really fascinating what we learned. The other thing that we got out of that whole project was we had debunked a lot of shared assumptions. Is anybody in here from higher ed? A few folks? Some? Good. So I, this is new to me. I'm not a higher ed guy. But when I came into higher ed from private industry, what I learned was the whole place runs on assumptions. I had a student once that had this issue. It must apply to every student I've ever seen. And then for Ivy Tech, it's even worse. We apply that same thought across the state. And that's not necessarily always based on data. It might be good information, maybe even be accurate information, but it's not necessarily based on good data. So um, one of the shared assumptions that we debunked with this whole project was that students that were bothering our students. There was this big assumption, and I, I shared it too because I'd heard this in my four or I guess five years at Ivy Tech, where we're bothering the students. We call them too much, we're emailing them too much, we're spamming them, we're pestering them, we're bothering them, it's just a bad thing. So this extra phone call about this prediction thing, it's, it seems like black magic and it's just not gonna help and students don't want it. So what did we do? On that call form, we asked that question. How did the student feel about the call? Anybody wanna take a guess on what the percentage of students out of 16,000 that we called that didn't like us calling them? Two. Good guess though. 2% of the students that we contacted expressed frustration or just didn't like us calling. The rest were either neutral or happy. They, and it was in between those two, it was the, the majority were actually happy that we had called them. Now certainly the folks that couldn't pay their electric bill, were, electric bill were happy because we could actually give them some assistance. But there were lots of other things, little things that you might think were little, that kept coming up that we were to help with. So the one assumption that we just totally blew out of the water is that students don't want us to contact them. That was actually the exact opposite of the results that we had. But everybody believed it. The provost believed it, every VP believed it, everybody believed it in the leadership. And when we looked at the data, guess what we don't talk about anymore? That. So that being said, does anybody have any questions? Sure, go ahead. As far as the callers are concerned? Uh, kind of beyond calling. I mean, beyond creating that kind of call list, mm -hmm. creating any kind of reports that are you know, delivered to the teachers or the Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so to be honest, that's still a work in process for us. We started this last fall. We did it this past spring. So we have two, uh, two iterations under our belt. And we are working with those folks, uh, the academic folks now, to come up with some other information to, to kind of help with that. Uh, we did certainly identify themes. Uh, time management was a big theme with the students. I mean, that was one of the biggest things. I've got a job, I've got two kids, my spouse works, or I'm a single parent. There were certainly themes around time management. There were themes around um, the bookstores I mentioned. Transportation was another one. Depending on where you're at in our geography of Indiana, transportation was a huge deal. So what we did with that was we took that data back to the folks that do the course schedules. And we said, are you scheduling these classes at a point where someone that doesn't have a car can actually get here? If you're scheduling the courses in times when the buses don't run or you know, whatever, if you're making it hard based on the timing, then you're not really serving the student anyway. So we've actually taken that feedback and we've given it to the folks that do scheduling so that now there's lots of conversations around, are we even scheduling these things correctly? Are we making it harder for the students because we're not thinking about the customer? So uh, it's still a work in progress. I mean, I don't have great answers, but we have taken that and done a lot with it. Sure, go ahead. So we use Qualtrics to get for the call logs. So the callers would, um, they were organized across the state. So the way they did it in central Indiana, which is where I'm based out of Indianapolis, is they had a room. They called it the success room, not the war room, because I got in trouble for that. It's not the war room. But we had a big room, and everyone would just go in, sit down, and then we would distribute you know, a small subset. They would call through there, and when they talked to a student, or they didn't talk to a student, they would fill out a Qualtrics form. 
the questions on that form were something that a committee got together and sort of figured would be helpful. Does that help? So the student affairs folks led that. That was not something they, the IT folks felt comfortable, and nor should they have been involved in all that. We would have probably really messed that up. Uh, but the student affairs folks did. We did help them from a data perspective, say, well, we need to know this. You guys can ask it however you want, but we need to know this. And then we worked with them, and it was a, it was a process, but it worked pretty well. Yes? So to answer your question is we haven't done that yet, but we certainly have the data to do that. Um, part of where we're at, I mean, as a journey, we're not, I'm not professing that we're experts at it, but I think we've had some success. That three point, whatever percentage, I think it's 3.2 or 3.3 percentage point I mentioned, that's 3,100 students pass their courses that would not have normally passed. For us, that's a big deal. 3,000 students is a lot of students. <clears throat> so we are still learning. Uh, we haven't gotten to that point. We certainly have that data, but the focus was clearly on, let's get them through midterms, let's get them to the end of the term, let's get them into the next term, and we really haven't uh, done a lot of analysis on that. Now, we have shared our data with a lot of folks in the college, and they may have done something I'm not aware of, but not yet. We certainly have it, but we haven't really acted upon that just yet. Yes? <clears throat> yeah, so that's something that we've talked to the, our president a lot about, is getting this information to the students, letting them, we've been calling it a credit score, it's a really bad name, but the Ivy Tech score, so that when a student logs into the portal or an, an app on their phone, they can know how they're doing and get recommendations proactively without us calling them and all that. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, we're very much still in the very early phases of, of, you know, using the data more proactively in these past two terms with the calls is really our first iteration, although we, we did modify it a bit for the spring. But that is something that uh, we actually met on just last week, is how do we get this to the students? Because there will be some students that will self-correct, which is great, and then that that's, leaves us more resources to work on the other students that may not. But we haven't gotten there yet. We're working through that, but we definitely have the data. Yes? To be honest, I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> that's something that we've, we've been working quite a bit on, and I think we may be reaching the point of diminishing returns. So we could certainly, and I, didn't, I don't have a slide up here, but I can tell you what we've spent on all this, and that might surprise you. Um, I don't know that spending a lot more resources getting you know, from 83 to 85% is gonna be worth a whole lot. There's always gonna be things that we can't control, right? You're a 4.0 student and you hit the lottery, guess what, you're probably not coming back. Or you move to a different state, or something happens, there's always gonna be a, ver a percentage there that's nothing we can do, that nothing we can predict. So if you take that out of it, then the question is from 83% to whatever that other percentage is, is it worth bridging that gap based on our you know, somewhat limited resources? So we are doing some things, we're doing some deep learning, we're doing some neural net stuff, trying to see if we can get a little bit better at it. If we don't get any better at it, I don't know that we're gonna pursue it a whole lot more and probably just say okay, and move on to a different problem. Yes? Okay. <laughs> we have all the data. Mm -hmm. And then we've got hundred plus different things we can look for. Mm -hmm. Not in the same form like multiple No, not at all. Not at all, right? Nope. So how do you tackle those those two? The data is finally testing. Great question. And I somebody raised their hand back there with this the lights I couldn't see. Um, <clears throat> that's an absolutely awesome question. Does anybody want to take a guess on how we do it? What we do with data cleanliness and normalization and all that? We don't do any of it. That's what we do with it. And, <clears throat> and this is a philosophical thing. I'm not a big fan of that. We incorporate that stuff in the analysis. So rather than spend a lot of time, and this is my, my opinion, so take it for what's worth, rather than spend tons of time on data governance and cleanliness and completeness and all this other stuff so that we can make the analysis easier, we use a different analysis approach that makes us not have to do those things as much. So I've, I've talked to a lot of different schools that have got millions of dollars invested in the governance and cleanliness efforts. And when I ask why, well, because we want to analyze it better. Well, just analyze it differently and then skip that part. And I'm not saying that we've done it correctly, but that's what we did. And we've gotten some pretty good results out of not going through that extra step. So what we do is if the data is bad, 
the data is bad. Now, the, the way we manage that, though, so that it all doesn't go bad, right, <clears throat> is that we are very open. We, we sort of institute what we call a data democracy at Ivy Tech, and that is the, the philosophy that anybody that needs data should be able to get it like that, and that's where Newt comes in. <clears throat> so even if you're a math teacher in Fort Wayne, Indiana, you can only see your students, so all the security is there, but you can see everything that you need to know, and you can get it almost instantly. If you're entering data incorrectly, everybody else can see that upstream from you. So think of it, maybe the registrar is a better example. So our statewide registrar can see uh, registration reports from around the entire state. If Fort Wayne's not putting in birth dates correctly and everybody is a negative age, we've had a few of that, then she can see that just like anybody else can see that and then they pick up the phone and say, what are you doing? And then they correct it. So we do have some things in place to keep the data as clean as possible, but we're not going to put a huge investment on doing all those things when our, our goal is, is not to have clean data. Our goal is to do good analysis and help students. So I think you, there's other approaches that compensate from that. Now, in some environments, your data may be so bad that you can't do good predictions, and then you have a different problem. But ours is not that, is not that way. So we really just tailor the analysis to what the data is without going through a lot of process and, and normalizations and, and adhering to you know, certain uh, models, data models. There's the higher ed data model. We don't bother with that because we don't need to do that in order to analyze it. That's, that's our approach, and so far, so good, at least. Y yes? <clears throat> so technical, in what regard? Sure. Yep, so we're a banner school. Have you guys heard of banner? Anybody? I'm sorry about that. Um, so we're a banner school, and so we are actually the largest, what I'm told from Aleutian at least, the largest banner school in the world from a data footprint perspective, so we got a lot of stuff there. Uh, so we pull data out of banner as it changes. So we use um, something called Golden Gate. You guys familiar with Golden Gate? Anybody? Familiar? So basically what we do is we pull the data out of the database as banner is changing it. We don't pull it out of banner necessarily. And we flow all that data into Redshift pretty much on the fly. That allows us to get a little bit, well, it allows us to get data out of banner because banner's, banner's sort of an oddball. Um, and we really try to replicate with it, whatever the source system is. So up until recently, we were a Blackboard school. You guys know what Blackboard is? Learning management thing. And now we're a Canvas school. So we would do every day, we would capture every detail record that Blackboard has. Whether it's useful or not, we copied every single bit of it and we do the analysis that way. But we really pull in the data based on whatever the source system can provide. So we don't want any aggregates. We don't want summaries. We want detailed row level data so that we can do, the machine learning works a lot better when you have that. Um, as far as an architecture perspective, everything uh, for the most part goes into Redshift depending on what the data is. We do have some other, we use EMR a little bit for some other things. Um, put all the data there. We use uh, Python for the machine learning, something called scikit-learn. If you, any math people in here that are familiar with that. So we build all the machine learning around that. Um, we do, most of the things we do are at Amazon because for us, we just can't afford the storage, unfortunately, um, any other way. So in our shop, we're maybe a petabyte of data, but we really, that's expensive storage for us, so we just do most of it in the cloud because we can blow it away and it's, it's pay as you go and, you know, SAN hardware and server hardware are not that way. Um, does that answer your question enough? Okay. Sure, all the other corner. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a, and, I, and I can't honestly speak to those call scripts because I, I, I mean I was involved at a very high level on their development, but that was definitely part of it. There were some cases where maybe dropping the course or withdrawing, and I, I don't remember the difference between the two, that was maybe more strategic and more to the benefit of the students to go one path rather than the other, but they did include that in those call scripts depending on the circumstances, but that's where the student uh, academic folks, the student advisors and those folks helped with that decision, but I know it was part of it, I just don't know the details. Yeah, you know, as far as the success of the student, I don't know how they, because they counted that. I didn't count that. So I don't know. From a prediction perspective, I know whether or not they were going to fail or, or, you know, or not. Uh, and that certainly holds true. But as far as whether that was successful for the student or not, I guess it probably depends on which group was looking at it. If finance and they, they dropped out and didn't pay, probably a failure. If it was the academic folks and it helped the student, probably a success. I mean, it probably depends on their direction, but I honestly couldn't answer that. Yes? Yes. How long did it take you to gain that? <clears throat> Excellent question. So, uh, 
gosh, short answer is a while. Um, <laughs> the, we started, we developed most of this capability about four years ago, I guess, and we showed it to a lot of folks in the college, and I mentioned black magic a little bit ago, and I think that's what they thought it was, a lot of folks. Um, so we actually kind of sat on it for quite a while. So we, every term we would refine it because it was kind of fun and we knew how well it worked. And then we, as an organization, we just didn't do a lot with it, unfortunately. And it wasn't until last August when Ivy Tech got a new president and when she came on board, we sat down with her and said, hey, here's this neat thing that we have. We've been doing it for years. What do you think? And her reaction was, we're gonna use it. And we're gonna use it in three weeks. And we developed that whole, that whole process and calling the students and the Qualtrics form in three weeks because she was new and said, you're, do, you're gonna use it. So when she got there, and she's got a background in um, industrial engineering and so process management stuff, so she saw the value in it, I think, pretty clearly. And when it comes from the president, at least in our organization, it happens pretty quick. Um, but up until that point, we did have a lot of folks that um, just were reluctant, and I don't know why. I do, I do believe this, though. Part of what I've seen now, in hindsight a bit, part of the problem was, was the, the nature of what we had. In higher ed, you know, for decades or, or maybe even centuries, it's always been reactionary, right? You got a grade and you got a midterm or with my kids, they got a test. And then I want to know why they got that bad grade. And it's, all, it's a reaction to something that they've done. <clears throat> so from a business perspective, all the business processes that we have were all built to be reactionary, right? You go see an advisor after you've gotten a bad grade or you do this after this has happened. That's all fine and dandy, but what we were giving them was something that was proactive. This is gonna happen to Eric, I like to pick on Eric here, but this is gonna happen to Eric if something doesn't change. And that's not something that fit into any business process that the college had at all. And that was very challenging, I think, for folks because I don't know what to do with this. When Dr. Elsperman, our president, showed up, she said, you're gonna do something with them, let's make a phone call. And that's how we started. Phone call is not the, is not the magic wand, I'm not, I'm not saying that it is, but that's how we started because we just started. Um, but I do think we were, we had given the college something that it really just wasn't equipped as an organization to deal with because predictive data is not something that I've ever seen a higher ed actually use, especially at the scale that we, that we've done it. Not that we're doing it right, but we're trying. Does that help? Any other questions or thoughts? Yes. So the question was around, are we planning to generate documents or do case studies or do something to help other schools? So that's, that's funny, on Monday I met with the U.S. Department of Education down the road here, and that was one of the things that they had brought up. So I don't know yet. Um, we've certainly talked to lots of schools, you know, through our, our, our friends at Amazon and through some other organizations. We have met with probably over 100 schools so far and, and kind of given them what answer whatever questions they had around what we've done and how we could help them or, or whatnot. And the, the Department of Ed folks uh, thought we were very good for us to write some papers and do some things uh, to sort of promote that. So I don't know where it's going to end up when I get back to Indianapolis to, later today and <clears throat> tomorrow. We're going to have some meetings about what can we do along those lines. Um, so we're always willing to help. If anybody wants to you know, shoot me an email or give me a call, I can certainly help you from that respect. As far as anything more formal from the college level, I'm not sure yet. Um, lots of people have asked, but I don't necessarily have a good answer. Yes? Oh, the cost. <coughs> yeah, so I can do that. Anybody want to take a guess? Oh, come on. It's more fun when you guess. What's that? $1 million dollars. Very close. So in the last four years, we've spent about $1.2 million on everything that we have. And I haven't told you everything, unfortunately, so there's a lot of other good stuff there. Uh, but we spent about $1.2 million in the last four years. Um, what it costs us today, and this is honestly um, just software, right? So uh, AWS guys are great, but they also want to get paid too, I think. Yeah, they do. So we do have to pay for what we consume there, but on a monthly basis, everything that I've showed you, and plus a lot more that I didn't show you, we pay $4,000 a month. That's it. Now, the staff that I have that's dedicated to it, I've, I've had that staff for years. They were there 10 years before I got there, so I don't count those folks. They're, you know, sunk costs, I guess. Don't tell them I said that. Um, but those folks have always been there. So just the technology change, we spend four grand a month. That's it. Um, <clears throat> the 1.2 that I mentioned has been over the last four years as we went through different iterations and we did some things poorly and redone them and you know, maybe we did some stuff we shouldn't have. Uh, that's just what we've spent. Uh, the other fun thing I'll, I'll mention along those lines, since none of my finance folks are here, um, about, gosh, it was November of last year, we sat down with our um, statewide registrar and we said, hey, can we help you guys analyze your data a bit better? You know, we, they were doing degree audits. You guys know what a degree audit is? 
I didn't know what that was until I came to higher ed. But basically, you go to college, you earn a bunch of credits, you transfer in a bunch of credits, you do a bunch of stuff, you qualify for something, right? So when I was in college, it was very automatic. It turns out in community college, not, not as automatic. And at our volume of data, it's, it's kind of hard even. So students are, in our organization, required to apply for a credential, whether that be a certificate or a technical certificate or an associate's degree. So blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> what we did was we sat down and we worked with our statewide registrar to come up with a better way to do what they were doing. <clears throat> so what we did, cut to the chase, is we helped them come up with a far more efficient way to find credentials that students have earned, but the students didn't realize it. So Eric, my t test uh, <laughs> guinea pig here, he went to college at Purdue, he did some stuff, he worked for a while, he went back and took a class at his next job, and then he comes to Ivy Tech to do a couple other things. Once all that information gets to us, we can realize Eric has earned an accounting certificate, but didn't know it because he wasn't pursuing accounting. Maybe he was there for nursing or something, I don't know. But he actually qualifies for something that he doesn't even aware, or is not even aware of. So what we did was we came up with a great way for our statewide registrars to find those quickly. And so what they did this past, it would have been December, around Christmas time, was they would have called Eric and said, hey, Eric, we know you're in the nursing program and we know you have all this. Did you know that you qualify now for a nursing certificate? Would you be interested in that? Or, I'm sorry, accounting certificate. And he would say, generally, yeah. And then they would say, okay, do this and you've got it. And then there was a number of associate's degrees that were that way. They had found a number of associate degrees that our students had earned, but nobody had realized it. The students definitely didn't realize it. And we had not been able to find it in the mountain of data based on our you know, banner system and everything else. So long story short, uh, we, we found 2,800 degrees or, or credentials, degrees, certificates, technical certificates in December, and all those students got a phone call. And I think the vast majority of them said yes. There were some that didn't for whatever reason, but it was well over 2,000 of them took us up on that thing that they'd already earned. Uh, now, the cool part to the college, and this is why the finance folks don't like me, but to the, for the Ivy Tech, we are largely performance funded by the state. So for every credential that we confer to a student or that student earns through us, they get, we get about $2,000 on average. So, so you know, a, a CT is worth less than an associate's degree, but the average is about two grand. So 2,800 times 2,000, right? $5.6 million that Ivy Tech earned from the state of Indiana in December because we have better use of our data. And that isn't where it stopped. We did it again in the spring and found another, I think, 1,200 in the spring. So what I say to my finance friends is that we've already paid for ourselves. Because you know, we spent 1.2 million over four years, we can do the prediction stuff. Now we've found millions of dollars worth of <coughs> state funding that we didn't know we had. We've helped, I don't remember, whatever that is, 4,000 or so students now have gotten a credential that they didn't know they had earned, all because we're smarter on how we can you know, sift through all that data that we've got. So while it did cost us 1.2, I argue that we've, that we've earned money. <laughs> yes? That's the next one. So that, that's, uh, it's funny that you mentioned that, but that's something that, we've, that I've been harping on quite a bit, that we should be able to give the student a much better roadmap. And I know there are systems out there that sort of do that, but they're not great. And as I'm learning, as I work more with my registrars, it's not as easy of a problem to tackle, but that's where we're heading. Um, I'm a big fan of that. When I was in school, I was an engineer, so I didn't have a choice, right? You take these classes, that's all you do. And it was very, it was very prescribed. I didn't realize until I came to Ivy Tech that it, everybody's not that way. But we're going to help the students get more that way. So that's what we're working on, but we don't have that today. Any other questions or thoughts? Or Yes. So of all of the big analytic solutions that were on the market, mm -hmm. besides the building, yep. what about the market was missing or what did you not like? <coughs> Excellent question. Uh, the answer was cost. cost. Primarily cost. So when we started, we did an RFP. We talked to all the big players. You guys all know them. I won't mention them, but you know them all. Um, seven figures, one, there were several in seven, one was in eight figures. And it was a huge process, right? So it was going to be hardware and software and professional services and meetings with everybody around the state. And yeah, that was just crazy. And so we didn't, mainly because we just couldn't afford to do it that way. And so what we did, we took my staff back and we said, well, what else could we do? And we made some phone calls, talked to some friends out in Silicon Valley and Seattle and all these other places and ended up where we are. Um, but that's why it was driven by cost. I'm sure if we'd had generous budgets, we probably would have bought something. And, and I would argue not be anywhere close to where we are today, but that's why. Yes. Canvas, yes. 
No, from a LMS perspective, yeah, we were a Blackboard school for years and we moved to Canvas just, I think, maybe three or four weeks ago, we, we went live with Canvas. No, that's not a free tool, but that's now our LMS that we're using and, and pulling data out of. Yes, oh yeah. One of the things we do as a rule, we will not do business with any vendor who will not provide us detailed data back. And that's in every contract that we sign, bar none. And that's, that is the one thing that we do to ensure that whatever third party vendor we're working with is providing data back to us. We may never use it, it may not have value, but it's a requirement on every contract that we sign. Are you using Canvas with Redshift to pull data out? Uh, they are providing us an API to pull data out, and I don't remember if it's coming from Red. I know they have a Redshift component. I don't know if it's coming from Redshift or it's coming from something more transactional, but I don't care as long as I can get it, yeah. <laughs> but I don't remember exactly what it was called. Somebody else had a question, I thought. Yes? Correct. So the question was, attendance is not a feature that we look at with the machine learning. Uh, the reason is because we're not a, an attendance-taking organization. I couldn't get a source of it. <laughs> so it, it just happened to be it wasn't an option. So it was certainly on our list, but then we didn't have it. We crossed it off. And then it turned out not to matter anyway. Yes? Nope. No, we did not. We did not. As I mentioned with the cohorts, we don't do. We just do everybody at once. So, um, I th as far the question was, would it work for smaller campuses or smaller organizations? It really depends on the amount of data that you have. So, what we've got is that blender that I showed in the picture of. That blender could be applied to anything. We just happen to be in higher ed. It's a very generic approach and it's a very generic model. As long as your inputs are good, it's going to do what you need. But in order for any machine learning to work well, you're going to have to have samples, right? You have to have something to train it by. So, if, if we were a, um, an organization with only a thousand students, we would have probably a different combination of features that were more granular. That way, we have the volume of data for the machine to learn from. Um, so I think you could tackle it that way, but we didn't. We just took everybody at once and, and didn't even bother with the campus concept. We just did all of them. Uh, it was just easier. We just had to have a tool that could you know, digest that much data. There was another, somebody else had their hand up. Yes? So the machine learning tools? So the machine learning tools we use are uh, Python is the programming language. We're a Python shop. So the model itself is implemented with Scikit-Learn. Scikit-Learn is an open source machine learning toolkit. Um, there's a variety of classifiers available. We're big fans of the random force classifier if you want to get into the, the nerdy math part of it. Um, the, the black magic really is not even that. The black magic is the features that you put in. So there, we really use two types of features, the ones I call organic and the ones I call synthetic. Those are my terms. So the, uh, the more organic uh, ones would be Logins to LMS, right? You can query that number. It's a number that exists in the system. You just got to add it up and you feed that in. So that might be a feature. Um, another one that I, well, an example of what a synthetic feature might be would be one that's not necessarily something you can query, but something you can derive or something that represents relationships between other data. And we do have a fair amount of synthetic uh, features that we use in order to get the predictions as high as they are. Um, we were, I don't know, in the 70% for quite a while, and we started using some more synthetic features. We got a good 12% bump in accuracy just based on doing it that way. But the black magic, the art, is really picking features and picking your granularity, if you're from, I'm talk all, all techie on everybody, but picking the right granularity of those features is really important. The other, the other advice I would give is just understand what you're going to do. Don't just start at making predictions. I would start on what problem are you trying to solve. If you're familiar with uh, machine learning and confusing matrix and things like that, those matrices can help you or they can hurt you, but it depends on what you're going to do with them. So for us, we actually maximize for false negatives, not for uh, confirmed positives. And I'm not using the right words there, but our, the, our, our maximization function or minimization function is a little bit different than what you would do because we know what we're going to do with the data. Um, again, the black magic really or the art is, is really in those features and then minimizing or maximizing that confusion matrix for what you're after. And I think that's, the, that's what I think a lot of people miss. But any other questions? Either they'd be more technical that or less. Oh, sorry, you're in the light. Go ahead. Oh, uh, that's one thing I didn't talk about. Development team, two people. I'm sorry, students? We have about 175,000 students a year. The students that would help us? Yes. 
No, so the, everything that I showed you was developed by two and a half people. I'm the half person because I have another job too. Uh, but we have two data engineers that help put everything together. We do obviously have a student body that's studying computer science. We have a lot of those folks. Uh, we do bring them in and we do have interns and we help us, but they didn't help on this project, primarily because we are sort of in an area where Ivy Tech is not necessarily teaching data science and, and teaching more of the advanced you know, stuff that we're using. But we do use students wherever we can. And we do have some other projects that we're using them on even today that's sort of neat that maybe next year I'll come in to talk about. Um, but uh, yeah, everything we did was done with two and a half people, two data engineers that help with all the data movement. And I did most of the, uh, the data science stuff up until recently. And we did finally hire a third person, which has helped me a ton um, to do some other new things. But yeah, $4,000 a month, two and a half people. Yes? Yes. <clears throat> so they, um, the question was around the features that we use, the stuff that went in the blender. Uh, was there was there any demographic stuff or test scores of that or things of that nature? So the answer is no. And there's a couple of reasons. We did not include any demographic data because of this. If you're a bald white guy that lives in Northwest Indiana, that is you know got three kids, which is me. There's none of those things we can do anything about, right? You're probably not going to make me move. You're probably not going to make me grow hair. You're probably not going to do a bunch of these other things. So while those are, I think, a great things to know from a research perspective, and I think in other use cases, that's 100% valid, we were trying to make the students do, or help the students do better. Calling Eric up and saying, Eric, you know, you're, you're a white guy and you live in Terre Haute. That's not helping anybody, right? We know that, but we can't change any of those. We focus specifically on behaviors because behaviors we can influence. Things about you that are inherent, we can't change those anyway. Now again, they're very informative, but they're not something we can act upon. So we purposely left out most demographic stuff to focus on behaviors because behaviors we knew we could change or we might have a shot at changing. Um, but we have done some other projects where we've looked at more demographic stuff and, and other things like that. And it's, it's fascinating what we've learned and talk about the debunked shared assumptions. I could go on for hours about that and some of those other projects. But with this specific project, no, we focus on behaviors because we behaviors we can do something about. And that's why. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so I've got two minutes left. The question was around synthetic features and elaborate more. Is there something specific you were looking for or? So really it came around, and I think I had a slide where we said, what does this really mean? How can we represent that in data? So like engaged in a classroom, that's a great one. How could you, how could you come up with a, a, a number or four numbers that would represent engagement in a classroom? So, uh, and, and I won't have time to get into this, but what we do is we feed in about 120 features, that blender we're throwing about 120 things into, and the machine figures out what's relevant and what's not relevant. And so in Fort Wayne, it may be these 10 things. In South Bend, it may be 55 other things that matter for those people based on some other variables. And that's where the, the beauty of the machine learning comes in. So um, around the synthetic features, what we would try to say is, uh, not, I'm just kind of thinking one off the top of my head, would be how could we represent your engagement in a classroom with four numbers or, or eight numbers? Well, one of them might be what are your, what are your classmates doing? So it might not necessarily be about you, but it might be about them because engagement is with them, right? And that's where the art, it, there's a lot of art that goes in and we won't have time to get into it in a minute and 45 seconds, but that's, that's sort of the thought process is, is it's not necessarily just about you, it's about the environment and what you're doing. And that goes back to engaged in a classroom. Well, what is a classroom? How many students are in that classroom? Where is it geographically? Did you have to drive to it? Is it online? So that's, there's a lot of features around, really just informative uh, features, if you will, around that. And that's, does that help at all? And we could certainly talk you know, later if necessary. I got about a minute left. Anybody else? Yes. Yes. <coughs> so what we did with that from for that particular one, um, so in general, I guess pulling out the good nuggets really is just a matter of looking at the data and sort of exploring and having you know the right skill set of the person looking at it. That particular one came out from the caller form. So callers are making phone calls and recording lots and lots of data. We had them record it in text. So certainly there were categorizations, right, one through five kind of stuff. But there was also just freeform text because that's really important. Most of our insight came from the freeform text. So we use a lot of natural language understanding software to go through and read those call forms. So think about it this way: if you've got 12,000 call forms, 
Who can possibly read those and gain any insight from any of them? Nobody, right? So uh, we do natural language understanding stuff, and there's lots of tools out there that'll help you do this, that do entity identification, that'll be able to pick out themes uh, and read the book for you, if you will, to help with that. Um, there's a lot of open source tools that'll help you do some of that, and some of it was just really honestly just looking at it and, and asking more questions, but that's um, sort of the way we did it. All right, well, thanks a lot. I'm out of time, apparently, so see ya. <laughs>